Well, today I have a prayer by um, Meredith Andrews that she put to music. It's called Draw Me Nearer, Lord. speak to us this morning and um, as I as you as a church you know um, not this past summer but the summer past the summer before last whenever I went to the Southern Baptist Convention in Phoenix and I found out about mission dignity and, and my heart was tugged um, and uh, uh, for us to be able to go forth and, and show uh, what little we can do but it turns out well, what little we can do compared with what everybody else does together can do a lot of good things for retired pastors and uh, and in some cases their widows and so anyways uh, dr. Morass is going to come uh, he's, he's from Dallas Texas um, home of the Texas Rangers you notice I didn't say Dallas Cowboys I said Texas Rangers because <laughs> but anyways uh, uh, but uh, Dr. Morass is going to come and, and, and talk to us. And, and what a blessing it is as a church for us to be able to partner with you. Um, there's been many that come before us to be able to go forth and, as I say, share the, you know, carry the torch. And that is to sh share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, whenever they need help uh, at the end, of stage, end stages of their life, it's a privilege for us to be able to partner with you all to be able to offer them some dignity at the end of their lifespan. So this is Dr. Moraz. Can you hit that picture? Can you click on that to see if it 
put the video? Mm -hmm. Do I need to put this down to it? Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, and uh, thank you to Brother Jimmy for leading this church. I was telling Brother Jimmy that uh, you are actually in the top 3% of all-time giving churches, uh, and we're just so thankful that you, that you give and that you give as much as you do. Um, the video, of course, was going to tell the story of uh, Roy and Janice Southern, who, uh, who uh, have been Mission Dignity recipients. Uh, they, uh, of course, uh, much like every other recipient there, uh, it has given their most of their lives and then come to the end and thought they had put back enough in retirement, and, but then, of course, health care costs and other things. Uh, catastrophic events happen and then all of a sudden you look at your bank account and you don't have anything and so uh, it is our privilege to be able to serve in this particular way and I do want to uh, just uh, give you just a few stats about us of course we've been around since 1918 and uh, it was originally founded by the Southern Baptist Convention and then as the retired ministers uh, relief fund and uh, and eventually became uh, called the Annuity Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, and then, of course, uh, changed their name to Guy Stone. And then, of course, uh, Mission Dignity used to be called Adopt an Annuitant uh, back then because of the Annuity Board. And, and, uh, and so we've been around since, uh, since 1918 helping out retired ministers and their widows, uh, as well as orphans back then until the Southern Baptist Convention became strong enough to actually fund orphan, orphan, uh, orphans and orphanages as well. Currently, our, um, we, we currently have about 1,800 individuals and couples. About 60%, 60% are widows. And then one out of every four of those widows are above the age of 85. And so these are people who are de desperately in need. It takes about $7 million a year, uh, sometimes more, uh, to take care of everybody. Uh, they receive anywhere between $225 a month and $600 a month, depending on need, and the amount of years served as well. And then, of course, we have expense grants as well. If you have something that comes up in your life, for instance, Hurricane Harvey hit 12 of our recipients. We were able to send out uh, funds to them within a week uh, because of the generosity of donors like you and your church. And then, of course, uh, we do send out a $250 Christmas check every single year as well. O.S. Hawkins is our president of uh, Guidestone, and he challenged us this past year to raise $8.5 million and, uh, and have a... Uh, a goal of 10 million. Uh, now, the most we've ever raised was last year was 7.7 .7 million, and 7.7 .7 million came in. 7.7 .7 million came uh, went right back out because our policy is that 100% of what is raised and 100% of what you give goes directly back to the retired ministers and their widows. Amen. Now, how do you? Some of y'all are sitting there going, "Well, how in the world do you get paid? And how in the world? Do, well." In 1981, there was an endowment that was established by a number of donors as well as uh, some of uh, the annuity board at that time. And it was established in 1981 that takes care of all operating and administrative costs. So we are able to go out and raise funds so that you might have full confidence that 100% of what you give goes directly to them. Amen. Now, I was telling Brother Jimmy that uh, when I was pastoring, I pastored for 22 years and was a professor for six years and did interim pastorates during those six years uh, before joining Mission Dignity a little over a year ago. And um, 
I, I can tell you story after story. When I was pastoring, uh, of course, we had people who were on Mission Dignity at the time. And uh, then, of course, as a, as a, um, a professor doing interims, I also had people who were on Mission Dignity during that time as well. Let me tell you about one of them. His name was Clarence Jones. He was a pillar of the church. Clarence, of course, uh, had pastored for about 23 years, uh, came to the end of his, uh, of his time in the ministry and retired him and his wife, Joe. When I went to visit them, I was interim pastor of First Baptist Gordonville. He was the guy that would, would supply preach for the, for the congregation and so on and so forth. And he was also the, the guy who would uh, teach the men's Sunday school class. Well, when I went to visit him, uh, they lived in a mobile home. Nothing really to retire on. Borrowed land. And within a few months of me being interim pastor, he contracted cancer. Within six months, he was gone. Mission Dignity stepped up and provided so that she could bury him, first of all, because she didn't have enough money to bury him. And then gave her an extra $5,000 so that she could get up on her feet and pay any medical bills or anything else. Let me tell you, my friends, when you give to this, uh, to this organization, you're refreshing the saints. Amen. You're refreshing the saints who are in great, great need. Now, let me tell you, we're also looking for more people. We're always looking for more people to help. So if you know of someone who is a retired minister or a widow of a retired minister, because we take care of the widows until they pass away as well. If you know of a retired minister or a widow of a retired minister, let us know. Now let me tell you, they will not come to you. And let me tell you why. They always are giving. In fact, most of our retired ministers and widows who are being supported by Mission Dignity give something back. And I, I could tell you, there was one that I, that I, I called right up, the very first week I was there. There was one that I called and, 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 uh, and I, said, I said, you're a recipient, you, you don't have to give. And she said, oh, you can't, you can't outgive God. <laughs> Amen. You know, these are the types of people that you are supporting. And my friends, thank you so much on behalf of the donors and on behalf of the recipients. Thank you so much for what you do. If you'd like to help us to uh, raise that eight and a half million beyond uh, what your church is currently giving, uh, come see me. We, we have uh, planned giving options and so on and so forth. Uh, other ways that you can give as well. Uh, you do a whole lot through your church, and I'm just so thankful for that. But if there's anybody who's touched during this time, let me let me ask you just to come see me. Uh, we have a number of people who do give in other ways as well. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, there's a little bit about me uh, that uh, that Brother Jimmy has already said. I was saved at the age of six, called to the ministry at the age of 12, began preaching the very day after uh, I was called to the ministry there at Falls Creek Baptist Assembly in Davis, Oklahoma. And uh, then uh, began vocational ministry at the age of 17, right out of high school. Uh, went to seminary right out of college uh, and uh, finished with my master's degree at the age of 24. Uh, then went back for a D-min and a Ph.D., and I don't know why I did that, but anyway, you know, like on uh, Hayden back there, you, once you get a Ph.D., all, your, all the mush gets into your mind and it gets cleared out of somehow, but anyway. Um, but, uh, but it is, and I became a professor, I pastored for 22 years, uh, my wife and I have been married for 23 years, um, we um, uh, have a son that's 21, and a, 
and he surrendered to the ministry as well. And then our daughter is uh, 17. She's a senior in high school, and she's uh, been on mission trips already to Madrid, Spain, and so on and so forth. We've got a great heritage of, of uh, my, my family just uh, loving the Lord. And we're just servants. Nothing special about us. Just dust with a soul that God has saved. And I'm just thankful to be here today. Would you take your Bibles and turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through, tw uh, through 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. And I have felt led to preach on this for a while now and finally developed a sermon to where I feel like that it can be preached at this particular time. I'd like to ask you to stand in honor of God's Word. I know we've done a lot of standing throughout the, the, the uh, service, but today we want to uh, honor God in His Word. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9-12. through 12. I've entitled this message, Combating Loneliness. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9-12. through 12. It says this, this is the infallible and errant Word of God that we're reading. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you so much for this time and we ask that you would move in this passage. Lord, we ask that you would take your word and infiltrate the hearts of each and every person here. Lord, I pray for those who are lost among us, that you would draw them to salvation, convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come, and let your spirit uh, quicken their heart, that they might turn away from their wicked ways and turn to you this day. For those who are saved, Lord, I pray that you would help them to be emboldened to go out and share the gospel more and to have fellowship with one another and to love one another and to love their enemies. Lord, we know that this love that you have given to us, we are to share with one another and with the world. And so we ask that you would give us power that we might be able to go out and share the gospel for your name's sake, so that you might save the lost. And Lord God, I thank you so much for this time and for this church. I offer up my own heart and my mind and my mouth and my actions, and I surrender them to you. And I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase. And that you, O oh Lord, would speak to this people. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. A rash of loneliness has captivated our nation. It's interesting when you look at the lives of school shooters that the common theme in every one of those young men who shoot up those schools is loneliness. Which is ironic because they have sometimes thousands of followers on social media. They seem to be connected to all these different people, but in, in every single situation, there is loneliness. Here recently, the rash of suicides among <laughs> men who are 50 years and older is actually on the same level as those in, ja in Japan. Now Japan has had for years a rash of suicides among men 50 years and older and all of a sudden here in the United States we too are having that. And the number one thing they say over and over and over again is loneliness. 
Why in a world full of seven billion people would people be lonely? My friend, let me tell you, Satan is all about loneliness. He loves for people to get into the state of mind to where they think that they are alone. Why? Because Satan always whispers in those people's minds five things that I'm going to point out today that the Scripture combats. The first one is this. You don't need anybody. Satan whispers, you don't need anyone. Well, God in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 through 12 says, what? Two are better than one. Amen. <laughs> Even in the Garden of Eden, uh, God saw man and what did He say? He said, it is not what? Good for the man to be alone. It is not good for the man to be alone. You see, the Word of God is always telling us that we are not to be alone and that we are not alone. But Satan whispers in people's ears, oh, you don't need anybody. You don't need to tell anybody your problems. You don't need, you don't need to be a burden upon other people. But what does God say? God says two are better than one. And it is not good for man to be alone. Let me tell you, my friends. I've heard people say, good men say, you are who you actually are when you're alone. But what does God say? God says it is not good for you to be alone. God actually says, no, two are better than one. In other words, you are who you actually are. You are who you are to be when you are with someone else. When you are not alone. You see what God says compared to what Satan whispers? Oh, you don't need anyone. And God says, no, you need someone. Two are better than one. Now let me tell you, I've heard this even from some of our widows. Oh, I don't want to be a burden. Oh, my friends. We always say to them, you're never a burden to someone else. It's our privilege to partner with you. It's our privilege to pray with you. It's our privilege to, privilege to be with you. Why? Because we aren't supposed to be alone. And you're not a burden. And you do need someone else. In fact, you need someone greater than any one could ever have, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. You do need someone. The second thing that Satan whispers is this. He says, you're worthless. But what does God say? In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, in verse 9 he says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. Now, here's the interesting thing. When you think about reward, you think about something that is given to you for something that you do, right? Well, what God is basically saying is when two people join together in, a, in work, in, in doing life together, what does He say? There's good reward for their efforts. Now let me tell you, that's why the church is what it is. One man cannot run the church. One man cannot do everything inside of the church. We serve the head who has a body, and the body has many members, right? And the body is, has many members and works as one, so that they might have good reward for their efforts. You see, you are not worthless. You are worth something to God. And you are worth something to someone else. 
in in this uh, in Luke chapter twelve verse seven, I love what Jesus says in Luke chapter twelve verse seven. He says, "Indeed, the very hairs of your head are no, are are all counted or are numbered." And he says, "Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows." If God looks after the sparrow, surely He looks after us, my friends. And he, you are worth more than sparrows. And think about this. You cannot count the number of hairs on your head. Now some of y'all are sitting there saying, well, there's not as many hairs on my head as I used to have. I understand that. I can testify. But the reality is, is God knows the number of hairs on our head. And my friends, you don't even know that. And you live with yourself every single day. And you look in the mirror every single day. And if God puts, puts that much detail into you and knowing you, how much more, my friends, do you think you are worth to Him? Amen. Oh, my friends, you are worth more than many sparrows. You are worth something. There is work to be done, and that work is worth something. Amen. Not only that, God, uh, Satan uh, whispers an, a third lie. He says, you've gone too far. You've done too much in your life. You've gone too far. But what does God say? In Ecclesiastes 4, verse 10, notice what it says this. It says, For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. If either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. You see, you may think you've gone too far. You may think that you've done too much. Too many evil things. Too many sins. I look at my life and I see all the sin that I've committed and I sit and I go, how in the world can God save a wretch like me? But He does. And He did. Amen. You see, God is in the business of when you fall, lifting you up. And He puts the church around one another so that when we fall, we are able to lift one another up. In fact, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, if you'll look over there, notice what it says. It says this. It says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, my friends, when I was a kid, I grew up in Central Baptist Church of Lawton, Oklahoma. And that was my, the church that I was saved in. That was the church that I was baptized in. I was called to the ministry, preached my first sermon there and everything else. I even became the interim youth minister uh, for them uh, when our youth minister left. And they had a 75th anniversary. And I was pastoring by that time. And they asked me to come back and preach the 75th anniversary sermon, which was quite an honor. Well, I went back to that church. And I sat there and I was thinking about all the, all the things that had happened in that church over the years. The, and I can honestly say some of the funny thing, funniest things that happened in my life were at church but as well as some of the most touching times in my life. Well, our church, when I went to seminary, our church was running about 1,200 people. And I remember just thinking about what exactly I could give to this congregation. So I started writing out all the names of the people that had touched me over the years in, in that church. 
friends, over 500 names. <laughs> so I get up and I start my sermon and I read the scripture and then I say, I want to start off by just reading off the names of people in this church that have touched my life. And I'm sorry that if, if I've forgotten anybody. But here they are, and I started reading the names. And after I started reading the names, all of a sudden people just started bawling in, this, in the congregation. Why? Because it is not so much about what happens behind the pulpit each and every Sunday. It's more about what the people do with each other throughout the rest of the week. Amen. Amen. You will forget about 90%, 97% of what I say within a week. But you will not forget when I shook your hand and I remembered your name. Now my friends, not only that, we are to be together with one another so that we might restore one another spiritually. My friends, too many times people in the church when they are struggling with something, they're ashamed to actually bring it before the church or to tell somebody else within the church. But that should not be. We should carry each other's burdens. Why? Because when Jesus was carrying that cross up on the hill, my friends, He was carrying our sin as well. He was carrying it all upon His body. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says in verse 21, God made Him who had no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. You see, He became our sin on that cross carrying all of our sin and we should carry one another because that is what we are here for. Amen. Satan whispers, you've gone too far. You don't need anybody else. And God says over and over, you need me and you need my church. Amen. Notice the fourth thing that Satan says. Satan says, you're unlovable. How many of you have ever had that? You're unlovable. What does God say? Two can keep warm if they lie down together. What is that talking about? Obviously, it's talking about marriage and about a lifelong partnership and so on and so forth with someone. The reality is, is that when a man and a woman come to uh, uh, come uh, and get married, they are to stay together for the until death do they part. And the beauty of it is, is that God is able to use that to glorify Himself in a perfect picture that that love sustains one another. Now, my friends, I talk with a lot of widows. Here recently, I was in, uh, earlier this year, I was in Kentucky. Got to visit a widow uh, there who's a recipient. She's been one of our recipients off and on for about 30 years. She's 100 years old this year. Born one and a half months before we were formed in 1918. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I had to check her birth certificate because she didn't look 100 years old. And she definitely didn't act 100 years old. She actually came in from gardening in the, in the backyard. But God bless her, I tell you what, she's a sweet lady, still teaches Sunday school, so on and so forth. Here's the amazing thing about her. She comes in, she says, she starts telling me her story, and she starts saying about how she got married to her husband at the age of 19. They went into the mountains of Kentucky for 43 years planting churches. Not just one church, a few churches up there in the mountains of Kentucky. Rode horses up there, rode, uh, rode bikes up there, you know, just 43 years. Her husband passed away. And then she worked for herself for a little while. And then some things happened in her life to where she was not able to sustain herself. Mission Dignity stepped in. And let me tell you, she said over and over, God would sit, I would sit there and I'd say, well, I'm alone, I'm unlovable, people don't love me. But over and over, God would always say, no, you're not. I love you. I'm here for you. I will keep you warm. 
And my friends, God does that over and over. John 3.16 is one of the most popular verses in the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. You see, God loves you even though Satan says you're unlovable. That's right. But God loves you. And guess who else loves you? Your church family loves you. You don't know this, but I, from the moment that I uh, started uh, talking with Jimmy, I put you on my daily prayer list. I shook almost every person's hand here, and I want you to know I consider you my friends. I love you. Some of you might say, well, you don't even know me. It doesn't matter. Because God loved me, I love you. Amen. And that's the way we all are. You share your love for the widows and the retired ministers. On a monthly basis, you are giving so that you can share the love of God with them by providing for them and refreshing the saints. Well, my friends, you are loving one another. Satan whispers, you're unlovable. But God says, no, no. They can keep warm. And my love will keep them warm. And then Satan often says, you can't win. <laughs> you know, one of the most interesting things about one of the uh, shooters is that he said that he felt like that he was a loser in life. Satan says that over and over. You're a loser. You can't win. What does God say? God says, if two are together, he can, they can resist. Notice what it says, the exact wording of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It says, and if someone overpowers one person, Two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. So who's the third? Who's the third strand? God. Two can resist being overpowered. The reality is, Satan says you're a loser. You can't win. God says no. With me, you can. Amen. With me, you can overpower the strong man. With me, you can overpower anything. I and my church are here so that you might know that you can win. Now, my friends, I don't know about you, but when I hear these things in my life, this scripture comes to mind. That a three-chord strand is not easily broken. Well, my friends, God has provided not only me a, a, a godly wife and two children, but also parents, brothers, sisters, in-law, and so on and so forth. Friends, family, people all around the nation that I know pray for me and love me. And I know that no matter where you are, my friend, you have the exact same thing. There are people around you who love you. And the church loves you. And God loves you. And He wants you to know that you can win. That you can overpower that you can overcome. How do you overcome? Well, James chapter 4 verse 7 says this, Therefore submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. All you have to do is resist and he will flee. Satan is a coward actually. He is a coward. All you have to do is resist. And he will flee. By submitting yourself to God. 
and resisting the devil. Have a faith in God because faith is the victory that overcomes the what? The world. Amen. You see, God has provided us a way out. No temptation has overtaken us that is com unless except that which is common to man. My friends, the weapons we that we fight with are not like the weapons of the world. They have power to overcome strongholds and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God to take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You see, my friends, what God has done for us through the power of Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, being resurrected from the dead, He has provided the victory for us. Amen. We sang just a little while ago, onward Christian soldiers. How in the world can we go onward if we're a bunch of losers? No, we're not. We are overcomers in Jesus Christ. We are overcomers in Jesus Christ because God has given us eternal life. Death cannot hold us. That is the God we serve. And that is the God who waits for you to trust Him this day. To give your life to Him. So that you might be able to have eternal life and the victory that overcomes loneliness. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? You might sit here today and say, well, that's good for some people, but not for me. Don't listen to that. That comes from Satan. Let me tell you, today, this is for you. Today, this message is for you. And today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to give your life to Christ. Some of you here might uh, here today might not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Some of you here today might not know Him. But my friend, you can know Him today. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, All of us are sinners, and we fall short of the glory of God. What is sin? Sin is anything that you do against God's law. The Ten Commandments give us God's law. One of those is, You shall have no other gods before me. So if you've ever put anything before God, you've already committed a sin. Another one is, Honor your father and mother. So if you've ever disobeyed, God, uh, disobeyed your father and mother, you've committed sin. And since all of us are sinners, we fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God is heaven, falling short of the glory of God is hell. Our sin, transgressing the law of God, takes us to hell. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life for Jesus Christ our Lord. We deserve death. That's our payment. But the gift of God is eternal life. God offers us a free gift of eternal life. So how do we receive it? In, in, in Acts chapter 3 verse 19, they asked Peter what we should do. And Peter said, repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out. That your times of refreshing may come from come from the Lord. You must repent, turn away from your sin, and turn to God that sins of refresh and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And Romans 10 verses 9, verse 9 says this. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And Romans 10, 13 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. My friend, today, in the quietness of this moment, call on God. Repent of your sin. Ask Him to save you. There might be some of you here today who have just prayed to receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. If you prayed and you repented of your sin and gave your life to Christ, my friend, in just a few moments when we stand and when we sing, come and meet Brother Jimmy here at the front.
Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33 says this. Jesus is talking to me. He says, If anyone does, uh, acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before the Father. But if anyone disowns me before men, I will disown him before the Father. You cannot keep Jesus private. Make him public today. There might be others of you here today. You have other needs. Maybe you need to pray with someone. Maybe you are feeling alone about something. Maybe you have, are stuck in a sin and you need restoration. Whatever it is, respond to the Lord in the way that He is calling you to respond. This is your time to respond to the message that God has given this day. Lord God, I pray that You would be with us this day and that You, O oh Lord, might have Your way in the lives of each and every person here. Lord, it is not by mistake that they are here. Lord, You know that they are here so that they can hear this message and respond according to Your will. Move in those who pray to receive Christ today. Move in those who have other needs. Have your own way. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.